Welcome to Thinking Green. Uh, I'm Rana, and today's show might be a little different from many of them because so many are related to like current events and upcoming events. And today's is more of a historical perspective than most of you uh, I certainly wasn't uh, very familiar with. So my guests tonight are uh, Dr. Catherine Hermes, who's the chair of the history department at Central Connecticut State University, and Alexandra uh, Maravel, right? Who um, is also a lecturer at, at CCSU. And um, we're going to learn about a tribe that most of us have not heard of from, from, from Connecticut. Uh, you know, we hear my, a lot about the various Pe Pequot tribes and the um, Mohegans, of course, but um, this is a history of another tribe that, that probably had as much of an influence as, as the ones that are more familiar. So welcome, Kathy, and welcome, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I guess I'm interested in how you got started with this research. Well, it, it started when um, I was hired at CCSU, and I was asked to be the documents editor for a publication called Connecticut History. And so the editor of Connecticut History said, if you can find some cool documents, that would be great. <laughs> and I came across. Um, Manwaring's Digest, which is famous to genealogists because they use it because it's a digest of wills from Hartford County between 1636 and 1750. So every genealogist knows this work. But there were eight Native American estate administrations in that digest. And so that surprised both of us. And we went to the Connecticut State Library and we got the microfilm of the original wills um, and made some discoveries. And that's where, so this is the issue of Connecticut history where we first published transcriptions of the wills, the full wills, not the little excerpts that are in the Manwaring Digest. And um, among the estate administrations were uh, the wills of Sarah One Penny the Elder, Sarah One Penny the Younger, and then another woman named Pompanum from Haddam. So, so those were really astounding finds. And we got so interested in these one pennies. Um, and I have to say that um, when we started doing this research, we had a kind of narrative in our mind, right? Um, and it's, it's sort of the standard narrative of New England that Indian tribes were decimated by colonization because of disease, and then of course mm. the Pequot War, and that relations were strained among the tribes. And of course, we also thought the Mohegans and the Pequots were all that was really going on, and then there were these other little tribes, like the Tunxas and Farmington, and then river tribes, right? We had no idea that there was actually this vast tribe called the Wangunk, with a grand sachem whose name was Soeg, um, or Sequin, he's sometimes called. Yeah, we had no idea. Absolutely none. And so the, the one pennies really stood out to us because they left all of their land to their um, grandson and nephew, respectively, a guy named Scipio Brown, or Scipio no. Tushis. I'm sorry, my, my yeah. mistake. Yeah, Scipio Tushis. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about Scipio? Scipio uh, as, as in as the, as Scipio in Connecticut as the heir to these Okay, wheels. so um, Sarah One Penny the Elder leaves f um, all of her land in the South Meadow in Hartford to her grandson Scipio. And it, it seems to be this um, tremendous effort to make sure that her grandson has this land and is protected in some way. And she, she says that um, she appoints William Whiting to be his guardian. Now I think at this point, we, ass we assume when she appointed him to be guardian that he was a young boy. But it turns out he wasn't all that young. That Scipio was young. Scipi yeah, yeah. Scipio right. wasn't all that young. But um, guardian, uh, she, 
she wants Whiting to take, take him under his wing, really. And he does. He actually, uh, you know, so many people think that the colonists are all going to take the land, steal it, and you'll never see them again. But Whiting fulfills his obligation. He, he, the court orders him to have the land surveyed. He has the land surveyed. Oh. The surveyors come back to court. And actually, it's all done very transparently in the court in Hartford. And so there's this relationship right away between the Whiting family and the One Penny family. Now, what role did the Whitings have in, like, Hartford government? Were they just family friends, or were they officials? Right. So William Whiting was the son of one of the very first ministers in the colony, John Whiting, who was very, very prominent. Um, and but he, actually, William Whiting never rose to the kind of prominence that his father did. He was a military man. He led expeditions to Canada, um, you know, led Indians and colonists to fight French and Indian uh, <laughs> troops. And he was also the sheriff so uh, for a while, and he also served in the General Assembly for a little bit. But he had, he had various He also roles. served in the probate, probate court for a little while. And he served in the probate court which would make him eminently qualified to deal with his will, I imagine. Right. And so we had a little shock about Whiting, too, <laughs> though, as we, as we started researching. So Sarah Winpenny the Younger, who's the daughter of Sarah Winpenny the Elder, she also left the will. And by this time, she was living in Middletown, not Hartford. Um, so the South Meadow that Scipio inherited land in or, um, originally is in Hartford. Now he's inheriting land in Middletown. Okay. So we found a record that he sold the land in the South Meadow to William Whiting. And at first we thought, uh -huh. uh, yeah, <laughs> so, okay, the bad colonists, yeah, you know, now it comes out. Now yeah. it comes out, right? He's, he's cheating this kid. Um, although we didn't know how old Scipio was at that time. As I say, we, we didn't have any any knowledge about him. Um, so we, we constructed a story, in, and it's, that's the story in Connecticut history, that Scipio was the last surviving member of this one penny family, that um, these two women were trying to protect land and making sure that he got it consolidated, and then what does he do? Typical of a boy, he sells it. <laughs> And, and that sort of fit in with what we saw in some of these other state administrations, where a lot of the Native men were going into debt. Um, they were serving in the wars, but often they came back from those wars not with money but with debt. And then whatever they had would get taken mm -hmm. by, the, by the state, or they would sell their land to try to pay off those debts. Right? So we were, we were seeing a story where women's fertility was down, there, weren't many, there wasn't a lot of childbirth, that's what other historians were saying. Made sense to Land us. Land is flowing out. Yep. It, it's just, it's sort of a sad picture. Right. A very sad picture. So then we went to Newport. And we went to Newport to do research on Native American legal history. But it was unrelated to the one pennies. We were now done with the one pennies, right? So um, you thought. So we thought. <laughs> so we thought. You know, here we are 20 years <laughs> later. Fortunately <laughs> not, though. Um, and... It was actually Alex who came across this. Oh yes, I'm, you know, I'm dutifully looking through. We actually had books in Newport. You didn't have to look at microfilm. It was so thrilling. 17th wow. century. 17th century court records, and you could just flip the pages. It oh is, God. it is such a thrill. But you very carefully have to, you know, read this old handwriting, and you're looking for. We we're looking for Native Americans and court cases. But as I'm looking, and there aren't that many Native Americans, but who do I see over and over again? This guy named, I, th I pronounce it in my head, Scipio. And after a while, then he becomes Scipio Brown. And then he's over and over and over. So finally, I turned to Kathy and said, you got to stop. You have to stop what you're doing. Take a look at this guy. I know he's not an Indian, but you know he's <laughs> really interesting. So we, we're looking at this guy, Scipio Brown, um, who is just suing and being sued all the time. <laughs> right. I mean, it's more than any other person in this book I'm reading. Yeah, there are like 30 lawsuits in oh you know, no. just a pretty short time. In a short time, there are 30. In his lifetime, as we do more research, there were over 40. 
-hmm. I mean, it's just unbelievable. More than any of the colonists, most of them anyway. Yeah. More than most of them. So, um, but it was just sort of like we put it in the back of our minds. Isn't this an interesting thing? Wouldn't it be kind of cool if Scipio Brown was re the same guy in Connecticut? Ha ha ha. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. And of course, we have no idea how common a name it was at that right. time. Oh, it was it, very common. In the 19th century, it's actually, Scipio is actually the most common name for enslaved Africans. Um, and it's partly it's how the colonists name their slaves. Um, they, they name them as jokes, Cato and Caesar and yeah. Prince, right? So it's the, op the exact opposite yeah. of what they are. Um, so, um, but, it, but it is also a name sometimes that does belong to prominent people. But we figured Scipio Two Shoes, we did figure that he was um, part African, based partly on his name and partly that when he sold the land to William Whiting, um, the recorder wrote down Negro deed. So that, so that gave us a clue that he looked black, um, but he definitely had a Wangunk mother. Now the Scipio in Newport, Newport. Um, is referred to as Scipio Brown Free Negro So-Called. So we didn't know no. what that so-called business was. Um, so anyway, we also wondered what happened to William Whiting. Because William Whiting, who had allowed all these Native American women to write wills and then was connected to every single person who had an estate administration. We didn't mention, I just want to break yeah. in, that yeah. Pompanum, he was a witness to Pompanum's will, and Pompanum's right. is the first will in, that we found in Connecticut. That's right. The first Indi Indian will, and William mm -hmm. Whiting is the witness to it. Right. And so um, he's connected to all of these. All of the estate administrations. Every so single one. So it gets one. curiouser and curiouser. Right. Absolutely. He had no will, and, right? So we're like, what's up with that? Yeah. Um, well, as we're going through these Newport records, we come across a lawsuit of William Whiting's, on William Whiting's estate. Well, now we're like, William Whiting was in Newport? <laughs> <laughs> we thought he was yeah. in Hartford. Yeah, it turned out he married a, a rich widow <laughs> in, uh, in Newport and uh, resettled there and became a judge on the Admiralty Court and he died in 1733, although we had a hard time finding that death date. Oh, yeah. Um, we didn't find that, in fact, until a year ago, I think. Last uh, fall. Last we fall. We just found yeah. it last fall. Yeah. Um, so we, we looked for his probated estate, but the records were lost when um, Newport was attacked by the British and they put their records on a ship and the ship sank so it's sitting at the bottom <laughs> of Newport Harbor. They've um, recovered a few fragments and we did have a fragment, yeah, that's, that's why we were able to see like a fragment of an estate administration letter, a few right. fragments right. Uh, and were right. salvaged from the bottom <laughs> of the deep. Right, right. And so, so we didn't really, so then we thought okay, it's, now it's possible, right, that Scipio Brown is Scipio Two Shoes because it's possible. Um, we called the author of a book called Bodies Politic, which is about um, politics in Newport and in particular the way in which um, Native people and African Americans um, are associated in Newport and what their lives were like. So called this guy and he said, oh, there's so many Scipios in Newport. I had a hard time keeping track of them. Well, they're all one guy. <laughs> They're all our guy. One guy. Yeah. And, um, and so, I mean, we didn't know that for certain. We, we were putting this all together. It's a 20-year puzzle. Um, and then we found in the account book of John Stevens um, a notation. Uh, John Stevens was a stone carver, right. but he did other things as well. Right. But he mostly carved the gravestones that are all in the Newport burying ground. And he had an account book, and he wrote, Scipio coming from Connecticut. And so then we have Scipio Brown's house right across the street from John Stevens' house. In Newport. In Newport, where Scipio right. from Connecticut is living, where we find another notation, William Whiting is storing his stuff. And we wow. got it. And we like, yeah. And it was, it it was, was, it was an amazing was awesome. moment. So I'm going to show another slide here um, that is a um, 
comparison of two timelines. Now, you won't be able to read these, but I just wanted to show this on the screen because what you see are Scipio two shoes where his life stops in Connecticut, it picks up in Newport. Um, and so it, it's pretty amazing how we were able to find this overlap. There's a little bit of back and forth in the 1620s, uh, in the 1720s, I'm sorry, um, in the 1720s. But then after that, he's settled in Newport and so is Whiting. And in fact, when Scipio is um, kidnapped, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's lots of this is a great to story. Make a movie about this guy. <laughs> this is a great story. We we wondered like what was going on with Whiting, and that is actually how we pieced together the date of Whiting's death. He was kidnapped within a week of Whiting's death. Yep. So his protector was gone, and the people who were after him knew that they could get him. And and it just shows that you know. Uh, although he was African Indian, uh, they didn't realize that in Newport because he presented as a free African American. But it just shows you how vulnerable they were, especially mm -hmm. if they were like Scipio. Um, of course, they said his name Scipio back then, but I think of him as Scipio because um, I took Latin in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Classical pronunciation. <laughs> just, uh, it, it just shows. I mean, he was in their face. He's suing them just as they sue each other, and he's yeah. doing it. Mm -hmm. But. Um, over and over, and they're suing him, and it's just, he's just in their face. And the minute Whiting dies, he's super vulnerable, and they kidnap him. Right. So when Whiting bought that land from Scipio, he paid him 40 pounds. And when they moved to Newport together, right, um, they, Scipio bought a house for 40 pounds. Well, then later on, he mortgaged it, and they were trying to take the house. So there's this long court battle, we won't go into it all here, but essentially he's losing, winning, losing, winning, you know, and it's back and forth, and he's trying to get his house. He takes it all the way up to the Rhode Island General Assembly and wins. It's just so amazing. He gets his house back. He gets to live in his house again after all these white people are just trying to take it from him. Wow. So, yeah. So what happened with the kidnapping? Did he have to be rescued? Did he escape? <laughs> Or do we not really know how he We got don't it? really know. He was held for approximately 60 days. Right. And we don't really know how he got free. Um, he did have lawyers. Um, two of the men who were on the Trinity Church vestry with William Whiting served as his attorneys. They served as lots of people's attorneys. Men, in Rhode Island, almost everybody had an attorney. That's how lawsuits were um, uh, done. It, it was. Rhode Island was very formal as opposed to a lot of places in New England. Rhode Island, everybody used an attorney. And Scipio used very, very famous attorneys. He used uh, one was the um, attorney Tim general Tim of Daniel Rhode Island. Updike. Updike was the attorney general of Rhode Island. It's not like he's getting these people that aren't known in the colony. Right. Um, he's using very important lawyers. But that comes, I think, from his connection to Whiting. Right. He's able to get these really good lawyers. Um, but all throughout his life, he's, um, he's, he's used his lawyers. But when he's held, it, for, when he's kidnapped, he's actually held on a false charge. And as soon as he gets, we don't know how he got free. Perhaps it was an attorney who mm -hmm. sprung him. That's kind of what we, we assume. Mean. We don't have any evidence of that. But the minute he gets free, he sues for false imprisonment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he yeah. sues. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a great guy. He's so <laughs> litigious. He's so pugnacious. He's so litigious. You just got to love this guy. <laughs> and, 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 you know, maybe there's a lesson <laughs> for today. <laughs> for people who are vulnerable or, or appear vulnerable, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, need to push some, you know, their weight around a little. Right, yes. Learn the system, use the system. Yeah. yeah. And this is what, what Whiting helped them to do, right. the, the, the Wangunk, because Scipio is a part Wangunk. Right. And all the Wangunk learn from Whiting, use the court system, so that Pompanum, that, uh, whose will was 1697, what she was using the court system to do with her will, I can't remember exactly when it was, but shortly before she files her will, wasn't there a statute? There was a law, there was a law that was going to open up um, Middletown and all of its surrounding environs had them included to settlement, to bigger settlement, right, where there could be individual land purchases. Because normally in the colony of Connecticut, if you wanted to buy land, from a native person. The colony had to authorize that. 
they were, I mean, it, it sounds crazy, but the colonists um, at the government level were in some ways trying to protect natives from false land sales, scams, cheating, that kind of thing. I mean, the, they cheated them, but, you know, <laughs> often. But, but there was some kind of attempt to regulate it at any rate. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated relationship. And, and I think that, um, you know, one of the things that we're really trying to unearth here by looking at the legal history of the Wangunks and, and Native people in general in the colonial contact period is exactly what that relationship was. I don't think it's been very well documented. And I don't think people really understand the, the give and take nature of it. I want to say one thing about Pompanum. Um, in her will, uh, she's the, the sunk squaw of 30 Mile Island, which we now know as Haddam Island. And she's leaving portions of it to relatives, cousins, her brother, other people that we had to track mm -hmm. down later. We didn't know who they were. Mm -hmm. But in the very end, she has a lot, she, although it's written in standard English will language, at the very end, she says something that is um, clearly of her own making. Her beneficiaries cannot sell that land ever. And so she's clearly trying to say, although the colonists want to open up land for sale, none of my beneficiaries can sell to them, no matter right. what the colony says. So she's trying to keep Indian Wangunk land in Wangunk hands. Right. And what's interesting here, too, is I want to get back to the one penny story, right? So we've, we've written this story, Scipio is the last surviving member of the one penny clan, and then Pompanum dies without without children, although she has heirs. So it looks like you've really got this declining population, right? So then eventually we get back to the records in Connecticut. We're done with Newport. We're going to get back to the records in Connecticut. And we start to look in the land records of Middletown. Now a guy named Timothy Ives um, was a, a student at um, William and Mary. And he had, he, he's done an excellent thesis on the land tenure of the Wangunk in Middletown. And has also published an article in Ethno History. And that was very intriguing, got us very interested. So we went back to the land records. And we noticed, and I'm going to show you another slide here. Um, I have to put my glasses on. Yes. Um, we notice a man named Mamusin who tells the court his genealogy. And he says, um, this and is in, what, tell them the year. And, and this is in uh, 1726. He says, um, Kikimus, uh, that he is, was born on the 15th day of last April, um, 50 years ago, the son of Kikimus and Sarah, his mother, daughter to Puamskin and Sunk Squaw. Long Simon, son to Sarah, above, said 28 years, the 16th of last March, and his son, Simon, born November 28, 1723. Peter Sanchu, son to Sarah, above, said, was 33 years. Well, you know, like, you have to decode this language a little bit, because grammatically it's very odd. But what he's saying is there's Puamskin, and there's the Sunk Squaw, and they're married. And they have a daughter, Sarah, who is married to Kikimus, and Mamusin is the son of Sarah and Kikimus. And then, um, then they have, uh, their three sons are Mamusin, Long Simon, and Peter Sanchez. Okay? So there are three sons of Kikimus and Sarah? Mamusin, Long Simon, and Peter Sanchez. Okay. Okay? Um, so that seems to be Mamusin's family. But the one thing that really struck me is that Sarah is the daughter of the Sunk Squad, but the Sunk Squad doesn't have a name. And it occurred to me this could be Sarah One Penny, the younger, and Sarah One Penny, the elder. But where's Scipio Two Shoes? Why is he, right? not, why is he not in there? And, and why would Sarah One Penny, the younger, leave all her land and all her possessions? And that's to her, to her, her issues. Who's her nephew? Who's, who's her, her nephew, nephew? When she has three sons. When she has three sons. So I looked, and then one thing that I honed in on were these signatures. 
So these are signatures on documents. And you can see there that the Sarah it has next to her name like something that looks like an H. It's not an H, but it looks like that. And Sarah in the first document you see is listed as Kembosh's squaw. I think that's oh. Kikimus. I think that's a, a version of Kikimus. And then in the next document, it's a signature on an estate administration from another native woman named Sarah Hopewell. And that's Sarah One Penny. So Sarah One Penny is Sarah, the wife of Kikimus. Wow. And that means that she's Mamusin's mother. So why is she leaving everything she owns to Scipio? Right. So then, as we start doing more of this genealogy, we start to realize that um, Sarah One Penny the Elder and Puwamskin also had other children. Um, in particular, their son was named Kushoy, who is, or Kushaw, who is the last sachem of the Wangunk, according to many histories, right? I don't know if that's true, but according to many histories, that's the last sachem. So, and Kushoy has two brothers, Sienna and Nanamarus, which we find in Middletown documents um, when they bury their mother. So when we have that will, that very first will, um, I'm gonna go back to it, where, um, yeah, right, uh, right there, where, um, where Sarah One Penny is leaving her grandson all her land in the South Meadow. At the very same time, she's telling her son Kushoy and her son Sienna and her son Nanamarus to sell land in Middletown to pay for her funeral. So to pay her debts. Mm. To, to pay, pay her, her debts. debts. And to pay her debts. Um, and many historians assumed that the Sunk Squaw, named in that other document with Kushoy, was a woman named Tohishke, who was the Sunk Squaw of Haddam before Pompanum was. Okay, so it gets complicated. I'm sorry, oh there's God. all these things. Yes. <laughs> um, but Tohishke didn't die in 1713. Sarah One Penny did. Not Tohishke. Tohishke died before, long before Pompanum died. So probably, seven, probably 1693, Tohishke was dead. Um, so by figuring out the death date, we knew who the Sunk Squaw of Middletown was. The, and it's Sarah, unnamed, and the unnamed, Sarah the Elder. Sarah the Elder. Correct. Correct. A lot so, of puzzle pieces. A lot of puzzle yeah. pieces. So did, we ever, did you ever figure out why uh, Sarah the Younger uh, left stuff to Scipio and not to I mean, her, so her own boys? We've been debating this a lot, and if viewers have <laughs> ideas, we're happy to hear I them. I have no um, idea. It's One thing we thought intriguing. was, because Scipio looked black, we thought maybe he was not as secure in his inheritance as the other native people in the reserved lands at Wongunk in really what's now Portland. Um, so we thought maybe this was a way to secure his place and make sure that he had land because they knew that everybody else would have land. They knew Mamusin and Peter Sanchez were gonna have plots, right? Um, I also speculate, and this is pure speculation, yeah. I also speculate along the way because we talk about these things all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I also speculated that she was trying to get her nephew to stay, to mm -hmm. not go with Whiting, to Newport, no. to not resettle. Right. Um, but that's just spec that's pure speculation. Right. And then it also occurred to us that of all the people we've come across, he was the biggest go-getter. <laughs> he, oh, yeah. he was the guy with the, the charisma. Um, and maybe because, because descent, like for the sachemship, wasn't just the eldest son to the eldest son, right? Perhaps they were thinking that he could be the next sachem. He clearly had leadership ability. Um, he clearly had Whiting's backing. I mean, he and Whiting, Whiting also had sons, by the way, <laughs> but he and Whiting are very close. They move together. They don't live together, but they move together to Newport. So, you very know. Intri uh, very intriguing. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so what, what happened to the tribe after that? Well, 
Are so there still wongunks around? There are. Um, in fact, um, if you read the Archaeological Society of Connecticut's latest bulletin, there's an entire issue um, on the Wonga, there and, um, and there's an essay in there by a man named Gary O'Neill, who is a descendant of a man named Jonathan Palmer. And we, so we can trace all the way back to Jonathan Palmer through Gary's genealogy, and he was um, a native person, and we have documentation that he was a Wongunk. Um, so we don't know past Jonathan Palmer. I've done a little research, and I think I can take... I when think I when can, was Jonathan Palmer? Jonathan Palmer was in the late 18th century. So I think I can take Jonathan Palmer's ancestors back one step, but I'd like to talk to Gary about that before I right. do a reveal on, on TV. <laughs> um, but, um, but I think that, um, well, and then I'll mention one other. There was a lawsuit um, not that long ago by a man named Van Green, and I've, I've never met Van Green, but um, he claimed to be a Wongunk descendant through one of the Wongunk women named Old Betty. And um, I don't know if that's true. I haven't been able to trace that, but he may have documents that I don't have access to. Um, and he wanted to try to reconstitute the tribe and wanted to claim some land in Middletown. Um, and that suit was dismissed. But, but yes, there are still people who are Wonga. Clearly there are. There are probably many people who don't know they are um, because many were reclassified in censuses as um, colored or black or mulatto or any other name. And um, it's very interesting. There's a book by a woman named Jean O'Brien, um, who's a very good scholar. And she has a book called Firsting and Lasting. And one of the things she points out in that book is that there'll be a number of people that you'll run across who are called the last Indian of thus and such, right? Last Indian of Middletown, last Indian of Farmington. And then they'll have children, right? So what are those children if they're not native people? Well, they're reclassified often as black with no reason to call them black. Now, sometimes they have intermarried with African Americans or with white Americans, but, but sometimes not. And they've just decided this is the last one. Now, is all the like ancestry.com testing that people are doing now, is it starting to reveal people who have you know, the, the tribal you know, descent, the Wagunk or the other tribes? They can't, they can't narrow you down to you're a Wagunk. Okay, because first of all, the, these um, ancestry DNA databases, whether it's 23andMe or Ancestry.com or any other one, they have a pool of people that they've tested. And when you're tested, it's who do you match in their mm. data set, right? So they might be able to tell if you're Native American based on the Native Americans in their data set. But they don't have a complete data set, and they certainly can't get you down to you're a Wongunk, yeah. <laughs> right? But I've been, doing, I've been doing a lot of genealogy. I now have about 40 trees, and I can take people well into the 19th century, and I'm sure that I can get them into the 20th century as time goes by. Um, but there are many families, like you'll recognize names like Capels and Simmons and a uh, number of others that are have Wongunk ancestry. Robins. Yeah. Well, as I was, you know, looking at, at what you wrote, I couldn't help but think of the challenges presented by the names. Yes. Uh, <laughs> like it, it, it just seemed so daunting that people's names changed and the spellings changed and the you know some of the the. Spellings were associated, it seemed like, with how you know the the original names were pronounced right. and had nothing to do with the spelling and the transcription into right. English. I mean, how do you overcome that kind of thing? It, it's pretty hard. I mean, uh, the the settlers weren't 
careful about spelling. There was no such thing as spelling, really. You know, like we all learned it in school, but they didn't care. Um, well, spelling so, norms don't come in until the early 19th century, really. Right, with Noah Webster. So, so yeah, so spelling is all over the place. You really just have to, especially if you're searching digitally, you have to try every variation. And um, if you're searching in some databases, it'll pick it up even if you haven't spelled it the way it's spelled. But if you're searching in some, you have to be exact. So you just need to try every letter combination. It's very, very time consuming. Very time consuming. And, and I'm guessing it makes it harder to verify that this person may be the same as this other person. Sure. And so we came across um, we came across one reference to uh, Mama Wohosk, right? And it said that she was the granddaughter and daughter of Soeig. And she was a sunk squaw in Middletown. We think that's Sarah One Penny. And we also think that because in Sarah Hopewell's estate administration, the one I showed you with the signatures, a little bit of money is given to somebody named Menumquask. And that is kind of like Mama Wohosk, but not exactly. And it could be a totally different person. Yeah, we have, to, could be we the have same. to deal with both possibilities could all be the time. The same person. All the time. And, mm -hmm. and I'm guessing you have to bring in other pieces of the narrative to see if they might match. If they match. Yes, right. you have to compare documents. And as Kathy was showing earlier, Kembush's squaw turns out to be Sarah, so Kembush is Kikimus. It doesn't really sound a lot alike, but it does turn out to be the same. It's because the, the M the M often has like a B or a P sound at the end of it. Um, um, oh, so yeah. so uh, we yes. say it differently. Right. Than and they would have And said. of course they would have said something more like Gigamush, right? And it which can sound a little bit like Kimbush, you know, like yeah. if you think of how a native is uh, or how a settler is hearing that and what they write down. And they're not always the most literate people either. Um, you know, they can read and write a little bit um, sometimes. So. And then there are no standards at all. No stand and no standards. Right. Now, I, both of you, uh, you know, are lawyers as well as academics. Right. And is there like a legal implication that, that makes it a more interesting topic, um, thinking about possible relevance to, to today, but also to our history? Mm -hmm. Well, one, one thing um, that we've been thinking about over the years is the way in which um, Native American law, or what they call federal Indian law, right, really changes everything once the Constitution comes in and you have the decision um, by John Marshall that Native people are domestic dependent nations, right? Mm. Um, so that, that really, that changes the whole nature of how whites and Indians relate to one another legally. But in the colonial period, there is some, we found in the court records, some willingness to accept Native principles of justice, especially early on. Later on, like as time goes by, they get less sympathetic. But early on, less you know, flexible. Less flexible, right? And early on, when a when a native person comes to court um, and says, uh, you know, you've wronged me in this way, the court will often try to do what a native would have done, right? Which is restore balance, um, reciprocity. Um, or you have a case perhaps where a Native American gets arrested for drunkenness. And then the Native person says, well, I wouldn't have gotten drunk if a colonist hadn't provided the liquor because we don't have liquor, right? And then they're like, oh yeah, right. And then they go get the colonist. And then the Native has to pay a fine to the court of a certain amount. And then the colonist has to pay the Indian the same amount um, <laughs> and to rebalance everything, right? Um, so, so there's some... There's some justice, occasionally. But it seems as though we got away from that. We did get away from that. And I think one of the important things of our work is we're trying to, we're trying to discover what some of those principles were, right? Because Native Americans didn't have jurisprudence. They didn't write things down in big treatise books. But they had what I call jurispractice. They had ways of doing things and ways of thinking about justice that 
We all have, right? We all have juris practice. We, even if we haven't been to law school, we all know what to us seems like justice, right? And, we, and if we have to go to court for any reason, we try to demand our version of that justice. That's juris practice, right? And then maybe and course- I would just like to yeah. note that Kathy inv invented that phrase and it's, it's come into use by other historians in fields other than this. Yeah, it's um, being used it for the Qing Dynasty now. I was pretty, wow. impressed, pretty happy about that. <laughs> um, just want to give her a little credit here. Yes. <laughs> um, but, I, but I do think, yeah, discovering that, we may be able to find what the principles of native justice were at the time of contact and get back to some kind of idea of what was there pre-contact. Well, it'll never be perfect, right? We'll never have a perfect understanding. But I think that's very important for Native people who are trying to find what's been lost after centuries of colonialism. It sounds like, you know, talking about the jurisprudence and jurispractice, that there are some lessons that we could learn because I think everyone, you know, agrees that you know, what's just and what's legal is you know, not always <laughs> a match in our current Very system. Very much. So, yeah, so um, one thing I was, you know, that interested me also is, you know, as you know, we mentioned in the beginning, the, 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 the Mohegans and, and the Pequots, whether the Eastern mm. Pequots or... Right. Um, the... Um, they're very visible in you know, Eastern Connecticut right. right now. What effects, you know, what, what influences whether you know, three centuries later um, a tribe is very visible or has really, you know, right. I'm tell you, in I'm obscurity? I'm going to uh, show you another slide. Okay. These people, these books by um, John Hammond Trumbull and William DeLoss Love and Henry Stiles, are the cornerstone of Connecticut history. So everybody doing Connecticut history, at some level, uses these books produced in the 19th century. And in part, um, because the Wongunk actually occupied a space that went from Hartford or Sukiog all the way down to Saybrook almost, right? And over to Killingly and, you know, and was all along the river, they were the, the river tribe. There they, weren't a lot of little river tribes. They were right. the river wow. tribe. But you hear all the time that there were these that there were just river tribes or bands along the river or clans along the river. And that's partly because these historians would name them according to where they lived. So the, the Matabesics um, are considered a separate tribe in some of these older histories, right? But the Metabesics were ruled by the children of Soig, and Soig was the grand sachem of the Wongunk. Um, Terramugus, who's famous in Wethersfield, was a son of Soig. Um, so a number of these people who are considered sachems or chiefs among the so-called other river tribes are really just children of the big guy, the head honcho, right? Of the Wongunk, Of yeah. the Wongunk. And, um, and that knowledge has not come into wide public. Right, right. And then William DeForest um, wrote a book, um, The Indians of Connecticut, and, um, and basically, did I say William? I think it's John. Um, but DeForest wrote a book, The Indians of Connecticut, and he has lots of errors in there, and they, and they get perpetuated. So I think some of it is that after the Pequot War, um, the Mohegans became so powerful under Uncas that nobody was paying attention to these other people who did sell a lot of land, like the land was flowing out of their possession. And then there was a belief that, they, that because they sold all their land, that somehow they disappeared. Right? And some went with the Brotherton movement, which yeah, was a- That's important, that some actually do leave Connecticut. Right, and, they, and so the Brothertons were a religious group of Christianized Indians under Samson Occam and Joseph Johnson, who settled in Farmington for a while and then moved mm. westward to Oneida, New York, and then finally from 
Oneida County, New York to Wisconsin. And so, you know, you, you can see, and, they're, and they come back and forth from Wisconsin as well. So there's leaving and returning. Now, did any of the other groups become Christianized? Or Mohegans did, yeah, um, under Samson Occam. And, um, but it was slower. Uncas did not want to be Christianized. He was not for it. Um, so it took a while for that to happen. But eventually, I think probably all of them became Christianized as they assimilated more. Now, I think we probably only have about five minutes left. And I, w I wanted to ask, like, what's next? What, where does the story lead in your mind? Or, you know, what paths do you think they might be taking you to? Okay, well, I'm going to, can I show one more slide? Sure. We yeah. have time. I was told I, it was, we have eight minutes, not, okay. not five. So, okay. so we can relax. Well, all right, so, there's two th so I'm going to go to this. These are Soig's descendants that I've, that I have so far, right? Um, well, I actually have more. You can't see the whole tree there. Um, but I've taken the genealogy of these descendants to the 19th century, and I think we'd like to expand that. That's one thing. Um, we also have more research to do on something that happened after King Philip's War. King Philip's War took place in 1675-76, and it was the defeat of the Wampanoags, but also of the Narragansetts, and, um, and in particular in Connecticut, it's, um, there's a guy named uh, James Warren who argues it really should be called the Great Narragansett War. Um, and um, the Wongunks were very related to the Narragansetts, intricately related. Um, yes, there were so political we, marriages. Soig's daughter, right. Warme, Warme, is Wawalom in Narragansett. Now, uh, is that related country? to the move to Newport back and forth, no. or is it totally is it separate? Totally separate. Totally separate phenomenon. Um, Wawalom married Myantonomy, the grand sachem of the Narragansett. So, and and there's more. I mean, there's much more interaction, right? And much more, re many more relationships. Yes, um, because. Kushar, who we mentioned, uh, the son of the Sangsqua, uh, marries Asquasadak, who is a descendant of my autonomy. Right. And, by the way, we should mention this, in the records in Middletown, she's described as an old blind squaw, Mary, or Tyke. And she is Asquasadak, the granddaughter, granddaughter of, of my autonomy. My autonomy. Um, so, you know, so kind of how people are portrayed is often not very accurate. But after King Philip's War, um, some of the Wangunk kind of disappear for a while, and including Sarah One Penny. Like there's nothing between 1673 and 1686. There's no record of Sarah One Penny. Where was she? Well, her father One Penny went up to Springfield to fight against King Philip's forces, right? But something happens in Springfield. Um, there's a commander who's very anti-Indian, and I think they're kind of forced to fight with him, and they, or fight for him, right? And they don't like him, and they leave. Now, we don't know what happens to them exactly. We're, this is all very speculative. But when we see them next, they're on a list of refugee prisoners of war, and they're kept near the Quinnebog and Chetucket rivers um, hmm. over, over there in eastern Connecticut for 10 years. Oh my gosh, 10 years. Ten I years. thought you would say like 60 days. Or and they can't, they can't come back to English society until they agree to live like the English. Um, and so Sarah One Penny, we think, we speculate, this is speculation, that in 1686, we next see Sarah One Penny selling land in Windsor that she owns. And then she, William Whiting gets married in 1686. And we think it's at that time she joins his household, probably as a servant or a you know, sitter to his daughter, nurse to his daughter, Mary, um, who's at her deathbed. Right? Um, and that's how she makes that association with Whiting. But we don't know what happened in Chetucket 
um, exactly. And that is an area we want to research a lot more. It sounds like there are a whole lot of, of threads that still need to be followed. Absolutely. Now, are there any um, descendants of the Wakonks who, who are interested in pursuing this, who have contacted you? Um, besides Gary O'Neill, I don't who, know. Who was interested in it before he even knew we existed. Right, right. He's been interested. He's, he's the family historian, and he's always pursued learning more about the Wakonk. Because there's a lot of oral tradition in his family. Right. So one more question, since mm -hmm. we have two minutes, okay. uh, is, um, is thinking about the history, is there anything political or s social that we should be doing to, you know, provide some balance in, you know, who owns what in Connecticut or, you know. So, I, you know, the, that's a, boy, that's a can of worms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, you know, and I gave you a whole two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think, so one of the things about the Wangunk is that they did lose all of their reserved lands by 1765, really. Um, and, and I think that story that they just died out or disappeared and aren't here really needs to be corrected. Um, I don't know that it's possible to give that reserved land back. Although my experience in New Zealand tells me that there's a lot the United States could do if it had the will. Um, in New Zealand, the Maori had a tribunal, the Waitangi Tribunal. And again, it's a complicated process, but they had historians, anthropologists, mm social workers, all kinds of scholars, looking into what happened to Maori land rights, what happened to their culture, how, were, how did colonialism affect them, and the Waitangi Tribunal tried to write it and restore land rights, yes. water rights, and New Zealand's made incredible progress in that. Now, yeah, New, Zealand's, New, Zealand, New Zealand's about the size of Connecticut. So um, the Connecticut River Valley maybe needs to be uh, revisited. Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Kathy and Alex. Uh, You're welcome. That was really interesting. It um, raised actually more questions, perhaps, than it answered. But that's a good thing. It's a, certainly a bit of history that I knew nothing about. Um, so thanks a lot for coming down. Uh, next, I just want to remind people before we go off the air, uh, June 2nd and 3rd is Connecticut Trails Day weekend. There are walks all over the state. I think Connecticut has more walks than any other state in the country. That's great. And um, so it's a good day for people to get out there. And we'll see you next week. Thanks very much, Ron. Thank, Thank you. you.